My personal condolences to those who have lost loved ones to the virus and also to acknowledge the concerns of, of the broader community at this time. I will be as brief as I, as I possibly can be and I will also be focused. My uh, remarks are directed entirely at the new powers to be conferred on the Executive Office. And these are extraordinary powers. Uh, and it would be wrong not to scrutinise them. It would be a dereliction of duty uh, not to place on record that these are very powerful uh, new tools being made available to the First and the Deputy First Ministers. Uh, and that we should have reservations uh, about them. Uh, and I have reservations in four areas. And if that amounts to me saying that my party gives qualified support to this bill, then so be it. It is a form of yes, but. And I would now like to work through those four buts. The first involves liaison between the Executive Office and the Chief Medical Officer or his designated appointee. Uh, there are two references uh, in Schedule 21 Part 5 uh, of the Bill to the Executive Office consulting the Chief Medical Officer, paragraphs 35.4 and 41b. Uh, furthermore, there is also a reference to the Executive Office having regard to relevant advice published by the CMO, uh, and that is at 41a. Now, this is a duty. In other words, it is not an optional extra. They must do this. And that is to be welcomed. But there is no compulsion on them to react positively to the CMO's advice. And you may say to me it is inconceivable that politicians would ignore the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, but it is a joint office. And that makes decision making difficult. And we know that. We know sometimes the Executive Office cannot agree. That is a fact. And I am minded of a time around 12 years ago when I was honoured to be asked by the then First and Deputy First Minister to be one of four people to set up the Commission for Victims and Survivors. And a day early on when a senior civil servant in what was the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister looked me in the eye with a smile on his face and perhaps too gleefully to be diplomatic said to me, well, you know, Mr Nesbitt, you're right, you have a statutory right to offer advice to Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness. And yes, they have a duty to listen to you, but they are not under any compulsion to accept your advice. And there is no compulsion in this bill for the Executive Office to accept the advice of the Chief Medical Officer. I would be much happier if on the face of the bill it said the Executive Office's decisions must be informed by advice by the Chief Medical Officer. But in the absence of that, I think it is very important that the advice of the Chief Medical Officer is published immediately and that the results of any consultation between the Executive Office and the Chief Medical Officer are made public immediately. It should not be treated like legal advice which is never published. We need to be open about this, not just because openness is good for its own sake, but openness and communication means the public are better educated and if the public are better educated, fewer lives will be lost needlessly. It's that simple. Fewer lives will be lost if we communicate, communicate and communicate. And on the question of communication, uh, a senior civil servant, as the chair of the, the committee pointed out earlier, engaged yesterday. And I know, Deputy Speaker, it's not normal to name officials, uh, or I believe it's not normal, but I'm going to because these are extraordinary times. His name is Chris Stewart, and since he joined the executive office, I have found him to be open, honest, communicative transparent, collaborative, not just open to co-design and co-production, but to embrace it. And these are values and characteristics in our civil servants that we need today more than ever before. And I think we should acknowledge that and appreciate it in the same way we must appreciate our health service, the cleaners, the tea trolley operators, the nurses, the doctors and the consultants. The people who looked after my darling mother in the last three and a half weeks of her life at the Ulster Hospital and who are now in the tip of the spear in the fight against this, against this virus. The second issue, uh, Deputy Speaker, is the type of event or gathering that the Executive Office might prohibit. Uh, and this is covered in Part 5 at paragraph 37.2. 
but it's vague. It says either a specified event or gathering or events or gatherings of a specified description. Now, I call this vague. The response I got uh, from Mr Stewart was that this was deliberately drafted to be broad and flexible rather than vague. And the rationale for that was that what was acceptable last week may not be acceptable this week. What is acceptable this week may not be acceptable next week. And I think that's actually fair enough. But I also need to put on record that I think one person's broad and flexible is another's vague and therefore troubling. There's been a lot of talk this morning about whether building sites should continue to operate. Could a building site be considered under this legislation to be a gathering? Uh, and if so, the executive office could therefore prohibit it. And those responsible could be liable uh, under... Uh, one second. They could be liable uh, under offences, which is paragraph 42.2 uh, of this bill, to on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding £100,000, or indeed on conviction on indictment to a fine which is unspecified and therefore unlimited. I give way. Thank the member for giving way on that crucial point. And, and given the vagueness, or this, well, maybe a different wording is what you've got in your email, but would you agree with me that it's that precise vagueness that is actually causing a lot of the widespread uh, confusion among many in the workplace? Because on one hand, they, they take social gatherings, etc., as prohibited. But on, on the other hand, many of them are gathering in the workplace today, um, unable to actually social distance. Uh, some of them questioning, is their industry key? Uh, these are questions that are continually coming up, and there seems to be no right and wrong answer. I, I thank the member for his intervention. My understanding, particularly with building sites, is that if you cannot socially distance, you should not be operating full stop. So I think that is clear. But I think this idea of what I'm calling vague and what officials are, are, are calling you know, deliberately broad uh, and flexible is a two-edged sword. It does give them the flexibility to say events have moved on from where we are today, but also in terms of communicating clearly to the public, it's not as clear as we would like it to be. And I think we have to accept that that is the situation uh, and there is no perfect uh, in this regard. The third of my four buts is with regard to enforcement now, enforcement uh, of prohibitions of these meetings uh, can be carried out under paragraph 41.1 by either a constable, which is clear, the PSNI, but less clear, the alternative is, by any other person or description of person designated in writing for the purpose of this paragraph by the executive office. It seems to me, Deputy Speaker, that's pretty sweeping unspecified persons designated in writing by the executive office have powers which at 41.2 include the ability to enter any premises and secondly, if necessary, to use reasonable force. Think about that. That means next time we gather in this chamber, one of these other persons or description of persons could enter this chamber and use force to remove one or more of the members of this legislative assembly. We have moved that far from normal democracy. I am not saying we should not do it. I am not saying we should not pass this bill. But I think we must be aware of the enormity of what we are allowing to become the norm. And probably not for the next three weeks probably more than the next three months. And if we are to give these powers to other persons, and, and let me say the response from the Executive Office is that no consideration has been given to that as yet, but it could be, for example, that we would want local government environmental officers to have those powers as they do in England. The question then becomes, will those other persons be suitably trained? Will they be properly resourced, including personal protection equipment? And crucially, will the public recognise them as having that authority? Or will they resist through ignorance? So again, communication is going to be key if we are to empower others beyond constables to enter premises and to use, if necessary, reasonable force. 
Uh, my final point is that while there are grounds under paragraph 42 2A for fines of up to £100,000, this appears to apply only to the owner or occupier of premises where an event or gathering has been prohibited or the organiser of such an event or gathering. In fact, at paragraph 37.7, it's actually explicit that this does not apply to a person whose only involvement in the event or gathering is or would be by attendance at the event or gathering. So attendees at prohibited events have no sanction against them. Surely this is a weakness. If we, we think about the gathering on Crawfordsburn Beach that was mentioned the other day, all those who attend do so knowing there is no sanction against them. It's only if you can prove, perhaps through social media, that there was one single source that started spreading the news that we should gather here at a certain time and a certain day. They can be liable, but nobody else can. And surely with these measures that we're putting in place, the inevitability, knowing human nature, is that there will be an underground movement. There will be gatherings. Over the weekend, I watched a documentary about prohibition in America. Al Capone's empire in current money was worth one and a half billion. His personal wealth, 550 million. There are people out there who will be aspiring to make money out of this virus. And surely we should be doing all we can to discourage people who perhaps through an innocent enthusiasm to mix and be, be social are going to gatherings and yet in this bill there are no sanctions. Deputy Speaker, I, I have no doubt that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister did not get involved in politics to have conferred upon them these drastic powers to restrict freedom of movement and freedom of association. In fact, yesterday, yesterday the Deputy First Minister gave us a very powerful graphic and emotional demonstration of why she is motivated to be in politics. Reacting to the news that a 32-year-old mother from North Antrim constituency is having her chemotherapy stopped because the National Health Service is having to make decisions because of this virus that it was never designed or expected to make. This system of government is called consociational, or in other words, we're all in this together. So let's be in this together. Uh, I've been reading on social media today messages from former colleagues in the media, hardened hacks who, who have covered it all from Le Mans, Enniskillen, Shankill, Greysteel, Oma, you name it. They're frightened. They are frightened as never before. And maybe they are looking to us. Maybe they're looking to us to do this together, to show the community that we serve, that we can serve them together. So let's lead together. I call Karen Mullen, the Deputy Chair of the Education Committee. I speak today on behalf of the Education Committee.